a dream. That's one small step for man. I am the greatest. You want something? Go get it. Period. Thank you so much, Renee, for hopping on. This is a long time coming to have this conversation, but I know it's going to be worthwhile one. I could just, I feel it, I sense it. So thank you. Your company, uh, just to start, Green Big and Company, mm -hmm. uh, I found that so coincidental because um, when my daughters were growing up, three girls, I bought them night shirts to sleep in that said, if you're going to dream, dream big, written over the night shirt. And then suddenly we meet and your company's called Dream Big. Could you, wow. what's, what's, what's the uh, essence of your company that suggests Dream Big? Right. So when I first started it, uh, the name Dream Big was taken. So I wanted it to just be Dream Big, but it was taken. So I made it Dream Big and Co. because the and Co. represents you know people. It says the and community. So it's people dreaming big, aspiring to achieve something that they've set in their mind, like a worthy ideal that they want to pursue and accomplish. Um, but the reason the company even came about was I was tired of seeing so much false news and misinformation um, on TV all the time. And I just wanted to have real stories and people's journeys um, recorded and for people to watch. So that was the company uh, formation, but the name um, a little bit different <laughs> as to why. Yeah. 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 So that's amazing. Yeah. yeah it's full circle. Um, having your children wear the shirts and now, us talking about such things, which we'll talk about dreaming big for yourself uh, eventually at the end, I'm sure. Yeah, for me, dreaming big ties into entrepreneurship. It ties into if you're going to spend time on things, you might as well have a cause because it helps you. You want to wake up in the morning excited. And so by dreaming big, you have a purpose. Right, so, right. Yeah, you need to be going in, in a direction, right? Yeah, and you have to have a cause. You're not, you're not doing things just for... Too many people do things because they have to or because they want to make money and that's their goal. Or mm. I really feel having a cause really is important as an entrepreneur. Right. Um, I was thinking that there's a... Towards our conversation, there's a common thread. If we're going to be talking in this podcast or podcasts about creativity, innovation, patents, mm -hmm. uh, making difficult decisions, how do you make them? Being an entrepreneur, being an investor, um, success and failure of startups, there is a common thread that I've experienced the last, uh, since the 60s, when I got into computers, 1964, there's been a common thread of thinking differently that we'll talk about of the concept of betweenness and rhythm being a universal concept. Uh, people that have influenced you, um, the power of single sentences in your life, how it's affected your entire life, value systems. <clears throat> For the last 60 years, those are all common concepts that, that have been a common thread. So that, that's why I'm excited to talk about um, creativity, patents, mm -hmm. entrepreneurship, making decisions, um, startups. Um, right. There's a common thread to everything I've seen. Right, right. Yeah, the, the kind of themes and meta themes, which we'll touch on, you know, the 60s with the spreadsheets and certain ways of technology then and how still, what, be it 60 years later, NFTs in the metaverse, there's still some same ways of going about technology that they did in the past then um, things we'll touch on but I like that point I would love to start there with creativity innovation um, I liked what you said um, when we were talking before and things we wrote down with um, building something it has this pattern where you you copy um, you you improve and you iterate and you go from there so I would love for you to touch on that because it seems like things aren't um, just created from new they're created from other things that are mimicked you know what I mean so that it builds upon itself yeah. just like the 60s technology all the way to the nfts now 
Um, so I discovered that the process of creativity, whether you're developing games or whether you're designing computer terminals, the whole process of creativity, I've seen an 18 month process in the case of engineering, whereby at the beginning you master something. So whether you master a game, you master understanding a computer terminal, you master it a process and then your mind says <clears throat> how can i prove on what i've mastered so stage two after you mastered is copying well first you copy you learn how to copy and then from copying you evolve into six months later can i add functionality can i improve on what i've copied and then a certain percentage of the people when they mastered improving and those are typically incremental um, improvements. They're not disruptive necessarily at that stage. But the next stage of improving becomes, gee, I'm an innovator. I thought of this radically new approach to what, to what could be done. And what if we, we, we did the following? And that can become disruptive and innovative and transformational. And so you go from, first of all, um, copy and first I'll master, then I'll copy. Then after copying, I'll add improvements. Then after that, I'll actually invent things. And so in an 18 month process, I've watched people go through those three stages. Um, and not everyone goes into stage three. They either improve incrementally or they move on to something different. But the true uh, full creative process takes you into innovating after you've figured out how to add value. It's really cool. Yeah, if, if you wanna play the game, you gotta know the rules of it. So you gotta get there, uh, you gotta work your way there in order to make changes to rules and, and know the bounds of the game to play within or reach to. And yeah. that ties into the process of, of innovation. Mm -hmm. And so um, I have a particular, approach to how to innovate. But the, the foundation, which only discovered maybe five years ago when I was listening to, to um, high school students innovating um, in a mentorship role, I came to realize that I was, I, I was born in Switzerland. My grandfather was born in Ukraine. Um, he walked over and took some kind of train to Egypt. Right. Grandparents were born in Egypt. Um, my well, my grandmother and my parents. Um, my great grandmother was born in Italy. My mother spoke six languages. My mother tongue is French. I was, I didn't know who I was. So I come from Europe in 1951, and am I Canadian? Am I European? Who the hell am I? <laughs> so I was confused till I was around, you know, late twenties as to my identity. Um, but then, as I mentioned, I realized six years ago that my feeling different as a person, um, I decided somewhere where to use my feeling different as a strength to think differently. And the concept of thinking differently made me want to see what would happen if I did the opposite of what everybody else did. And the concept of doing the opposite a field is going in one direction. What would happen if I did the opposite just because I feel different and I want to do something different? And I discovered that by looking in the opposite direction, you discover things that no one's considered. You discover you actually can innovate transformational innovations, disruptive innovations, because no one's looked there before. And it's often, it's often patentable subject matter because people didn't look in that direction. So they didn't discover things you, you discover. So I always encourage people to use and embrace each of our differences. People talk of uh, what do we have in common? I say, no, what do we have that's different? And let's embrace it. Mm. And let's use our differences as strengths to innovate. And um, that's completely exciting to me, the process of innovating through thinking differently and through thinking the opposite of a field. So as examples, um, 
going back to the concept first of creativity and then how to innovate, creativity is everywhere. Uh, there's a, at the National Film Board, I experienced huge creativity. Um, I met people from Bell Labs, engineers, Ken Knowlton wow. from Murray Hill, New Jersey, who came over. And I thought, wow, creativity and engineering. And then the patent lawyer to patent the spreadsheet, um, the patent attorney was creative. A lawyer being creative. I thought, what? <laughs> A patent lawyer is creative? <laughs> my finance in the 80s. I asked him, what, how do you structure an investment instrument to raise money for the company? What's standard? He said, nothing standard. Structure the investment to the values of the investor. If the person is a pension fund, they want their 8% return. If someone's a venture capitalist, they want their X percent return per year. An angel investor wants their 10 times return. Whether they want a loan, a convertible loan, a preferred share, Everyone has their own value system. The structure of the instrument to the value system. I thought, wow, a finance guy being creative. <laughs> Accounting can be creative. Wow. <laughs> so creativity, whether it's the sciences, arts, engineering, there's creativity everywhere. Mm. And I was, you know, I was narrow minded uh, at the early stages of growing up to then discover that creativity is everywhere. Then. Uh. To, to how to innovate, doing the opposite. Um, I, I did that early. So the first thing was the, um, the status of computer art in the 60s. Everyone was doing computer art from a scientific point of view, mathematical curves, algorithms, transformations. And so the state of the art in the 60s was this digital Mona Lisa where, where uh, Phil Peterson uh, mm. by satellites that transmitted from the original Mona Lisa in the Louvre, 100 characters per uh, point per, um, and, and overlaid and created a digital Mona Lisa that they printed on a plotter. Yeah, I think one, one thing for people listening on audio, um, what Renee's showing is the Montreal Star at Weekend Magazine and the Mona Lisa being uh, digitally made from its like physical rendering. So yeah, you keep going though. In 1968. And then you had uh, Boeing Aircraft designing the ergonomic man for their cockpits to figure out the most optimum way to design a cockpit based on the ergonomics of a man. Wow. You had... And this will be on the website as well if people want to look at these images. There was uh, Frederick Nike from Germany who was using a plotter and doing, again, uh, art using a plotter of different inks. Mm. And you had Lloyd Sumner, who, who was an artist and a computer programmer, um, designing using mathematical algorithms to art, but he could do both the programming himself and the and the, um, as an artist could, could see what he thought was aesthetic. Uh, fast forward today, when at the time in the 60s, you had collaboration between the computer programmer and the artist in the NFT space today, you have artists learning about the technology of blockchain and how to mint an NFT mm. and working with computer programmers for, to develop a smart contract so they can sell their right. NFT or hitting a mint button. So you're into the same structure, notion of collaboration between artists and computer tech or software individual until over time, the same individual has both skills. And the software developed enables individuals on either side to be able to use tools to, to express, express their creation. And so uh, you get an evolution of tools, you get evolution of education, people learning each other's skill and art. Um, and so it's kind of fun to watch how there's a parallel between the 60s and today in, in that space. Yeah, it's incredible. Um, it's like it's leading that. It was leading towards where we are now, slowly. Yeah, yeah, just better tools. You've you got Blender, you've got real time, you've got real engine, 
um, Unreal. You, you've got um, Unity. You've got all the software. You've got 3D generation of images. You've mm. got uh, all kinds of algorithms. Um, so it's really evolved from what used to be for me in the 60s. So, so what I was leading to is doing the opposite. So you had an industry that was using mathematics and algorithms for computer art. And again, what, doing the opposite, I thought this is awfully boring and scientific, maybe aesthetic in many cases. <clears throat> What's the opposite of that? So I started doodling with a light pen on a computer screen, rotating this image um, and in the 3D space of X, Y, Z and different speeds. <clears throat> and I did these little birdlings, which I showed to Norman McLaren, <clears throat> who is the grandfather of animation at the National Film Board. We used to paint on film. He used to scratch the sound on the soundtrack. So he was that outstanding that he could, he could control the rhythm of the motion by painting, repeating images on each frame and the right number of images to, to achieve the right motion. So I showed him the light pen in the screen and the funny doodles on the screen rotating and moving all over the screen. And he said two things that impacted my whole life. Um, if I was born today, this is what I'd be doing. And I thought to myself, wow, someone who's so capable using fundamentals of animation um, is actually open to technology as primitive as it is and embraces the technology. He was the most humble, outstanding, creative individual you'll ever meet. And, and I thought if, if he can embrace technology, I was 19 years old, he was in his 50s. If he can embrace technology, coming from such a background, I'm going to embrace technology all my life. <laughs> I'm going to be open-minded open to yeah. anything and everything. Yeah. Uh, because such a man was open-minded. He was such a role model. And then um, he had a sign on his wall, which uh, in his, where he did his animation. <clears throat> on the sign, it said, it's not what's on the frame that counts, it's what's between them. I thought to myself, what on earth does that mean between frames? A year later, I was on a date and, and I'm listening to a song, I'll never forget, Will You Marry Me Will? I make the comment while driving, I love the rhythm. And the girl says to me, okay, big shot, what's rhythm? <laughs> I thought to myself, how do I get out of this? What would Norman say? <clears throat> so I said to her, you know the notes on your piano? <clears throat> it's not the notes that's important, it's what's between the notes. <clears throat> the signs between the notes is rhythm. <clears throat> then for the first time I realized there's a parallel between audio rhythm and between visual rhythm. So Norman had been talking about visual rhythm being the spaces between the frames. He had full control of knowing how many frames to put, to duplicate, and then when to change it and how. So visual rhythm was a parallel to audio rhythm. And then I realized, my gosh, um, this was later, I now understand why a squirrel, when he buries a nut, um, it doesn't get stolen from another squirrel. It's because of smell rhythm. If it applies to eyes and, and sound, it must apply to smell. And so when, when a squirrel buries a nut, it's got a smell rhythm memory of where it located it. <laughs> Nothing to do with, with uh, knowing where it is. Mm. Um, then I realized that, the, which will come up later when we talk about homemytreasure.com and rhythm, mm. that rhythm is a universal concept. Um, and we'll come back to that because it's so important. It applies everywhere. But to go back to the concept of doing the opposite in, in presenting something that was just fun, uh, computer generated. Um, we, we created the first artistic computer animation that was shown at the International Film Festival in 1967 at Expo. We got a standing ovation. I didn't realize any implication of it. Um, for me, it was just showing a fun film. Um, and the concept of doing the opposite then applied to the conference system. At the time in the 1967, you were dealing with punch cards and fixed columns. And I was annoyed by the concept of having to 
be so specific and have to define a column that I was going to put a field in. So in, in at the film board being challenged with, can you design a online conference system? Six weeks from now, there's going to be this, all these filmmakers coming from all over the world at Expo for the conference. Um, I said, sure, not knowing what I was getting into. And uh, I had to figure out how do I avoid columns? How do I let people on teletype 35s that were 10 characters a second, how do I let them enter in their own information to register? How do I let them leave messages for other people and retrieve their messages? This is 1967. I didn't want punch cards. I didn't want columns. So I thought, okay, let's go variable field. Let me put a slash between fields. And just, you have a list of fields and you let the people type whatever they feel like in a variable field, their name, their address, their function, the hotel they're staying at, their phone number. Uh, just type it in. As long as you put it in sequence, put a slash between the fields, you're good to go. And so people registered by themselves. <laughs> All they needed was a list of what to type and what order, put a slash between it. You want to retrieve a message? Type one. Mm. That retrieves messages. You want to leave a message? Type two. Click on two on the keyboard. And so the notion there is user interfaces. Simplicity, simplicity, simplicity. User friendly. And so the slash in the online registration system, which made things so easy and user friendly, became the reason I thought of the spreadsheet. And so I'll come, I'll just fast forward to two years. Um, um, I used, I, I said to my friend, instead of our developing software in Fortran to solve a problem for this Belcanda manager that's got all these forms, why don't we simply let him type what he has in every box and separate it by semicolon? Let a semicolon be the delimiter so he doesn't have to think. Type your formulas in each box, put semicolon between each box and just type away. If you want to randomly define what's in a box, use a set command, set box 108 or set box 2013 or set box whatever. And so let the computer do all the work, let the user interface make it super easy for the user. Forget the programmers, you don't need them. And just use a semicolon. So again, user interface, simplicity, let the user do, do. they know the best what their problem is, what their information is, let them just type it in, make it as simple as possible for them. So that was, again, the opposite of what the field does. The industry was doing was thinking programmers should be king. We're all going to wear white lab coats. We're going to have one big computer. We're going to control the world. <laughs> Users are going to depend on us. That was the attitude of programmers. And I said, yes. I, yeah, I, I didn't buy into that. I said, the programmer shouldn't be king. It should be the uh, user. Mm. Um, the multimedia game, again, the concept of doing the opposite. The, the state of the art in 1968 of, of uh, education was a computer would ask the question, how much is one and one? Person answers whatever, and the person the computer says, right, wrong. So the concept was computer asks a question, user answers right, wrong. Computer gives you the possible answers, user selects an answer. And I thought, what's the opposite of that? Why don't instead of the computer asking the questions, the user can ask the questions? to each other, playing in teams. The users can make up questions, uh, make up answers, possible answers. Why should the computer have it all done ahead of time? Why don't the people as individuals <clears throat> who are watching a multimedia film <clears throat> on a film loop, the most boring film possible, nobody wants to watch it. <laughs> if they're watching actively and making up questions about what they're seeing in a game format to stump the other players and the other teams, and the computer's in the middle just controlling the chaos of the game, then everyone's being exposed to how everyone sees everything differently. Mm -hmm. And so you will look at something totally different than I will, the same item. You're looking at a glass, you may look at the shadows and reflections. I may look at the content of the glass. I mean, someone else will look at what's a glass made of, physically, like what kind of materials are made of. We all see the same thing differently. And to be exposed to what each each of us sees through a game. At the time, um, I just graduated 
uh, I was graduating from McGill. And I was wanting to go to Harvard just to get the the uh, credibility of what my thoughts would be. So the only reason for getting a degree there was so people would listen to what I had to say. Thought might be the same, but I had more credibility if I had a degree. And so right. I I applied to to um, the School of Education, and I said this is 1968. Um, and spring i said i'd like to combine education film computers psychology games they wrote me back a letter saying which i still have you have no focus <laughs> you're rejected so i invented the first online multimedia game with people interacting as i described it was and um and it was more advanced than anything they were doing there and it combined film loops computers psychology games and um they asked me to reapply. My friend, we were working at the film board while going to college. They asked us to reapply for the masters. They so they, re they reached out to you and said, "We want to." No, I no, I called them up and 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 showed them what we had done. <laughs> oh god! So, so the dean the dean connected us with some people at the university wow. and asked us to reapply. But uh, I don't want I don't want to give up on, on on them, and I was annoyed by their letter, saying I had no focus. <laughs> <laughs> And so it was just annoying. So, yeah. Uh, so, so we developed the multimedia game, and then, again, doing things different. It was just a common theme to innovating. Um, I thought we can use a multimedia game. We can have people in a game show format competing across the United States. We could take some of the common themes, like the Price is Right, and um, other game shows where people got prizes. Uh, so I said, let's call the producer of College Bowl. There was a nightly show for many years. It was colleges competing in, in a panel structure. Um, college A against College B every night. And uh, the producer of College Bowl, that was sponsored by General Electric, um, loved the concept of cities against cities. We did a pilot for him. He got General Electric to agree to sponsor the TV show. It was going to be called King City. And we're going to have consumers all over the United States every night, like a sports event, and there'll be listings every day as to who's at the top of the league, which city. And you had computers uh, phoning in. You had an acoustic coupler for $10 where they put their phone. Those phones were rotary, so you had to convert it to a dial tone. So, so they would pay $10 for their acoustic coupler, and they would register because to win prizes of a car, a refrigerator, uh, appliances, mm. all sponsored for free by the sponsors. Uh, it was worth their paying $10 uh, to participate in the game show and register. And and if your city won, and if you had answered, were one of the people who had answered correctly, at random, you'd win prizes mm -hmm. for winning every day. And uh, and so the, we got it. So John John Cleary approved it as a producer of Calls Bowl to do King City. John Electric approved it. And at t shut it down and said, you can't have 40,000 people lifting up a handset in a city. The analog telephone network will go down. So just oh, lifting wow. the handset, just lifting the handset will knock down the network. Because <laughs> it wasn't digital network, it was analog 1969. Mm. And so here they are with all these uh, similar shows sponsoring <laughs> these shows today with text messaging answers and with voting. Uh, but 969, you couldn't lift up the phone. You you were you were like uh, ahead of the curve. Is, is well, the fun, yeah, the fun part is you don't have to worry about bots. You don't have to worry about people voting multiple times, mm -hmm. and the audience was winning prizes. I still haven't seen that today in today's game shows that are that are uh, national and where audience participate in any way. And so by forcing people to register, they to win a prize, they'd have to register. So you got their name, you got their information, because you'd call them live and say, you won this frigidaire, you won this car, you won this, <laughs> this thing. <clears throat> and so the, they still haven't put that into the shows today, uh, 40, 50, 60 years later, it's about 969 to today. Mm. Um, so it's a cool element. But again, just to finish off on the concept, doing the opposite of what's going on was how to innovate. Yeah, I remember, and before we started recording, I had heard something a while ago, and 
repeating it now is uh, it's better to be different than better to be better because, you know, even with what I'm doing now with uh, scaling out restaurants at the current company I'm at and startup, it's, it's like, we don't have a Greek cuisine. We don't have a Mexican cuisine. We're doing Greek and Mexican. Well, mostly Greek with a little bit of Mexican. So it's a fusion that's different and it catches people's eye catches people's tongues <laughs> um they love it but rather be different than just be a little bit better than the rest of the competition because that'll really separate you as you've been touching on with your many many amazing examples yeah um yeah it applies to every field exactly Any other field. yeah it's universal yeah i would love uh, to uh real quick for people listening the uh, you probably get into it when we go into the patents section, but an explanation of of what companies you built and what you're working on now based on what led you there through the years and what you've been touching on just before um, with brainwaves. So, right. So at the moment, um, the last six years, I created a company called Brainwave Research. Um, to just brainstorm and develop products in the construction and electrical field because my partners have that expertise. So I typically build a tech company around bright people. So if I, if I am not able to innovate, I just build companies around people that I think are brilliant and creative. Um, and so the industry in the electrical receptacle industry and the control your receptacle um, they don't detect electrical arcs properly. And I want to eliminate electrical fires and save thousands of lives and billions of dollars in property damage that take place every year. And so the question was, everyone's so cost conscious in the industry, they're saving every penny. So I asked the question, what if we ignore cost? We may add a dollar cost in materials and we put a computer processor in a receptacle what could we discover? And so once you ignore the limitations and the trend, you can innovate was my earlier point. Mm. And so saying, it doesn't matter what it costs, let's see what comes out of it. So putting a computer processor and sensors in a receptacle, we were able to discover the true signature of arcs, and what create, how arcs really work, electrical arcs. And so Every industry has its uh, marketing presentation, I'll call it. So the LED industry will tell you it's got 25 year life. Well, the LED may have 25 years, but not the electronics. The capacitor may only be good for two years, electrolytic capacitor. But the marketing says 25 year life. The compact fluorescent tubes, when they came out, CFLs, uh, oh, it only uses seven watts. It didn't tell you it takes 15 watts, it's a power factor of 0.5. So really it's drawing double the energy that you think it is. The uh, radiation industry, uh, when I was manufacturing computer terminals in the 80s, there was a flyback at the back of the monitor. It was emanating magnetic fields. So you would get more radiated behind someone's monitor than being in front of your own monitor. So because the waves would radiate from the flyback, and yet the industry was saying, oh, no, they're perfectly safe. And I was saying, no, we're radiating people. Even though I was manufacturing them, I was supporting the public service union saying, hey, guys, I'm in a field where we're hurting people. <laughs> we're sending out these magnetic fields on pregnant women, and we shouldn't be. Wow. And the whole industry is denying it. And so finally, thank God, now we have flat displays. We've got LED displays. The flyback's not there anymore to cause the harm. But... In the electrical industry, safety, um, I believe that uh, people are not presenting as accurately as they should be, that the receptacles and breakers do not detect electrical arcs. And it's by nature of the technology. The technology, by virtue of how it's um, engineered, cannot detect electrical arcs. That's a wrong, that's a wrong technology for it. And I could go into details, but it's on the website brainwavecorporation.com. But by, by um, putting a processor in the receptacle and discovered what real electrical arcs look like 
and we're the only company in the world that solved how to detect, for example, series arcs, and how to differentiate what's referred to as nuisance tripping. So your vacuum cleaners, your electric motors can cause a breaker to trip on a legitimate arc, and our technology enables you to differentiate it. But the concept was do the opposite. Don't worry about the cost, throw a CPU in there and see what you discover. And we filed over a number of technologies, over 500 patent claims across 35 categories of innovations uh, because it was a wide open field for us. So once you begin innovating in a different area of a field, the world's wide open to you to discover things. Right. So you, you guys, you said you had filed 500 patents or there were 500 patents filed within the okay, so several, several patents where there's many claims sometimes there's 120 claims 150 claims 80 claims and the patent but, office comes back to you and says hey you've got too many inventions in one patent here are the 10 categories the one patent we think should be separated div divided into different patents mm -hmm. so we have over 30 categories of inventions as per the patent office uh, belief. And so we have to separate out the patent into separate patent applications. But there was over 500 patent claims across all those 35 categories of innovations. Right, so how, how, I know individuals who are building amazing things, um, close to people who are doing that. In your eyes, because you're, adept with it, you've been through it. How does one go about the process of patenting something effectively? Yeah, that's one of my favorite topics. <clears throat> and, I, and I have helped many people just for free, just because I love the topic of, it, it, it's such an exciting topic for me because I love inventors. I love creative people. Mm. So often they don't know what they invented. <laughs> so <laughs> go ahead and invent something, but they don't know how to patent it. Mm. So in terms of Creativity, I mentioned the patent lawyer in 1969 that I worked with to figure out how to patent the spreadsheet. Uh, we decided on, after two weeks of brainstorming, that it was the forward referencing, the fact that cells refer to the results of future cells. So the instructions were not being executed in sequence. The, they were resequenced first in the case of our process to, to the compiler decided what to execute in what order. But that took two weeks. And, and, our, and the topic of patents, the, 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 there's two relevant points. I was looking at the betweenness of things. So the relationship between cells, because the topic of betweenness being universal in rhythm will come up again. So by looking at the relationship between cells, it was forward referencing that was patentable. By trying to figure out what is a core invention which I'm referring to inventors don't know, most inventors don't really know what they invented that's totally different from the field until you ask them the right questions. Mm. And so the patent attorney, Charlie Curfee, told me if you're gonna patent a sewing machine, you don't patent a sewing machine. You, you look for the hole in the needle and you patent the hole in the needle. If you get that patent claim as an independent patent claim, it doesn't matter how they design the sewing machine, they're going to infringe on your patent claim. And so the art of figuring out what to patent is to see what cannot be circumvented. And to do that, you look at the relationship between items and the relationship between the needle and the sewing machine, the hole in the needle is the betweenness. And so <clears throat> looking at relationships helps you establish are the relationships in what I invented? And from, I can usually in half an hour ask two questions to get the inventor to understand what they really invented. First question is, would you be upset if, and so I look at the patent claims that have been drafted by the patent attorney and I see comprise something that says ABC comprising of steps one, two, and three. And I look at the person and say, would you be upset if step three was not addressed? If someone just did steps one and two, would it upset you? person typically will say either, no, because that's already in the field, or they'll answer, yeah, of course they'll be upset because they're still using my invention. And so by asking the question, would you be upset if, 
you get to the core because the individual knows what they invented but cannot verbalize it or they haven't figured out how to present it in a patent claim. Mm. So by looking at patent claims and extracting and saying, very often the patent attorneys love to see patents issued. They make them very specific. It's the easiest way to get the patent office to say, yes, we approve your patent. But it's so narrow that 95% of the patents, I believe, are not valid because they don't protect the inventors because they can be circumvented. The patent claims can be circumvented. You eliminate a step, you do it slightly differently. They didn't get to the hole in the needle. So <clears throat> whenever I'm giving people input to the to the value of the patent claim that they've already got drafted, <clears throat> or how to find what truly is a patentable claim, it's always what would upset you if. And then when the patent claims are drafted, I say to the person, what if I gave you a $10 million bonus and, uh, $10 million, a $1 million bonus and $10 million R&D budget. Can you get around these patent claims that are drafted? Either of the following happens. Within 10 minutes, the, the inventor says, of course, I would do this, this instead. Well, that means the patent lawyer didn't draft it properly. Mm. Or, or um, the, the inventor knows how to circumvent his own patent that's been drafted typically. And, but they don't realize they do. So you go through a claim and read it to them and say, can you, can you do it differently than what's been drafted? Can you get around what you see as drafted? If you had an unlimited budget and you got a bonus of a million dollars. So they'll, they'll answer it within 10 minutes or the next morning, they'll come back and say, hey, I, I realized how I could circumvent the claim that's been drafted. So the art of pan claims is the hole in the needle, so it can't be circumvented. What makes you upset if someone were to eliminate certain steps or do something differently? Mm-hmm. And could you get around your own patent claims? And so within an hour in any field you're in, doesn't matter what the field is, those simple questions can help you figure out what did you invent? Mm. And help you by, those are the only questions. You just keep asking the same questions over and over again to the inventor. Yeah. Would you be angry if they took out the cellular part of that claim? It's no. uh, yeah, it's like the simplicity point you brought up before. I think of like if you keep asking why, you'll get to someone's values, right? If you keep, um, as you said, asking them these simple questions for patents, you'll get to the point of the intention or meaning of their uh, invention, and uh, it kind of forces them to say how can I build the best defense against making the best patent so no one um, can mimic it? Or, yeah, circumvent, exactly. Yeah, yeah it's, it's a really fun topic. It's fun to see the inventors and the creators think about what they invented and, and answer the question, no, it's already in the industry. Or yes, I'd be angry if someone didn't do this step. And so with just half an hour of, of asking the same question over and over again, you can get to the core of the invention. What did they really invent? So if you ask any of your friends that have those inventions, offer them, say, go back and read the patent claims. And if you had a million dollar bonus and unlimited R&D budget, could you get around them? <laughs> you'll, you'll get a true reaction as to how strong is a patent that was drafted. Exactly, yeah. yeah. That's and, and you don't have to, you don't have to understand the field. You can just look at the patent claims and say, what if you didn't do this one step? Hmm. What if the key words that are in that paragraph in that sentence, you took out those three key words? Would you be mad if, if those three words weren't there and somebody circumvented your patent? And if they're right. angry, then it's it's a wrong claim. Change the patent claim. That's amazing. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, so on that, on that point, you have the, in making a patent, there's a lot of thought, deep thought that goes into it um, because of even the questions you brought up that you posed to people. And um, you have to make sure you iron those out or else the whole thing won't be prepared to be effective. <laughs> so there's a point that we wanted to touch on with 
how to make difficult difficult decisions. Um, well, before we go there on the patent topic, you'll find uh, that there's always a debate with startup companies, uh, especially as to the value of patents and should we bother to patent it? Right. The fact is, if you don't have a patent, how will you license your technology unless you're producing it yourself and the value of the patent is to protect it somehow? How do you license another company if you don't have a patent? Because why should someone pay you 2%, 5%, 10% royalty on your patent? And then someone else can just, if there's no patent, someone else can do it for free. And so why should, why should they pay 10% when someone else can just execute the same product because there's no protection? And so having a, being able to license someone requires that you have a patent or else why should anyone pay you a royalty? Because the industry can go and copy it, and yet these poor people are paying a 10% royalty to you when nobody else is, because <laughs> they've either circumvented it or they, they there's no patent to begin with. Mm -hmm. So the patent is, is valuable to license. Um, the problem with patents is 95% aren't valid because they're badly drafted, or they don't cover the invention properly, and they're very specific. Um, and the patent battles are costly. So an important patent battle, um, like when we sued Lotus for you know, $500 million, 1989 to 1996, for infringing our software patent, that was the first software patent in the industry, which took 10 years from 1971 to 1982 to be approved, allowed, um, overturning the patent office at the appeal court. The lawsuit process can cost three to $5 million and take five to seven years. And so in our case, we had to find lawyers on contingency who believed in the patent to be able to finance the patent. We had to find someone else to finance the patent lawsuit um, because we didn't have the three to $5 million to spend. Um, and at the end of it, you realize something which in this book called noise, which I'm in love with, it talks about decision-making of judges as one of the small items in one of the chapters. And so after the patent lawsuit that we lost, because uh, the, the judge had to decide who to believe, the inventors or the patent attorney we fired in 1971 that Lotus hired to testify against us saying we pulled the patent office. So she says, I have to decide who to believe, the inventors or their own lawyer they fired in 1971. I choose to believe the lawyer she wrote in her, mm -hmm. <laughs> her judgment. And so she's, she ruled the patent to be unenforceable. And uh, my lesson there is you can be right and, and yet you can lose. You can be wrong and yet you can win. And so how judges make decisions is up to them. And there was further information subsequent to it to the lawsuit, but it was too late, where the same lawyer that testified against us at, at a, a, a appellant court was held for gross wrongful misconduct against clients in the 70s, another client. Had the judge had that information during the lawsuit, perhaps he would have ruled in our favor, but that information wasn't available. The patent examiners, of which one of them is on my board of directors at uh, Brainwave, Patent examiners we overruled over those 10 years in the 70s to get the patent issued in 82, were, would have testified in our favor, explaining things that were confusing to the judge and, and could have would have turned the case in our favor, but, but they weren't allowed to testify as retired examiners. Mm. So, so retired examiners weren't allowed to testify about old cases, which they had heard, this is like, 1970 and 1996 were suing 1989 to 96 and so at the end we we filed a lawsuit against the department of, uh, department of congress about the right of patent examiners to testify they said you can't sue us because your case um, um, is active or inactive uh, is no longer active and and then uh, they weren't allowed to sue the, the the Department of Congress, U.S., and then they they changed the policy after that <laughs> of examiners not being allowed to sue. 
So it's so difficult enforcing a patent. That's why if you license your patent, you really want to make sure that the licensee is strong and they can help defend the lawsuits if there are lawsuits. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. So, so the whole patent world is, a, to me, a fun world from a creative point of view, from the inventors, from the seeing if you can draft a really good patent claim that's solid. Um, but in the end, you're subject to the courts if it goes to court. Mm. And you may want to just license industry very inexpensively. So it's it's convenient for an industry to, pop, to, to license it. Yeah. So that's why you see all these battles for billions of dollars between Samsung and Apple and mm-hmm. all these big corporations fighting it out in the courts. Yeah. So they yeah. are valuable if you've got a really good patent, a pioneer patent. Right, and right. Sure. It's great lessons for people going down that path. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You still need to, to file the patents, though, if you want to license them, the technology. Mm-hmm. Um, back to the value system discussion you're leading into what what was your question yeah so the well i made a previous point that um i just like your process of asking questions to get to the core of things that's how simple questions like even asking why usually lead to the core of someone's intention or value system which both reflect each other but all of this patent process making is very difficult difficult decision making um it requires a lot of creative thought so in the next point, I wanted to get your thoughts on the ability to make difficult decisions and how you had learned that from your mother. Um, uh, if you want yeah. to expound on that, yeah. Yeah, so there's some things that are, that are universal. We'll come back to the concept of betweenness and rhythm mm-hmm. um, and how that's universal. Another universal concept is when you make decisions, make them based on value systems. It's not a checklist of here's all my pluses, here's all my negatives. So in 1982, I was trying to decide do I sell my company that was doing 22 million in sales, we kind of got Lampard Technologies. Do I, do I sell half the company to ITT in the States or Electrolux in Sweden with both indicated interest? And I asked my mother, who do you pick? She didn't answer who's going to pay you more. She didn't answer who's more strategic. She said, who, who, if they're your partner, won't keep you up at night pacing the floor at two in the morning. They won't upset you. I said, that's easy. The people in Sweden. ITT, as an American multinational, has a reputation that if you mess up on a quarter's results and projections, they may come and shake, you, shake up your company. And change the management and disrupt it if you miss a couple of quarters of performance. The people in Sweden are so nice, I can mess up for two years and they'll leave me alone. <laughs> so, so I won't be under the pressure of two in the morning, waking me up upset. And so the decision was easy. The value system was, was there. Um, in 1986, um, I asked my mother, how do you always make such wise decisions? And she said, I pick the value system, they'll be the basis of the decision first. Once I know what the value system is as a basis, the decision's easy. And that's why going back to 1982, it wasn't money, it wasn't strategy, it was what, what's going to uh, help you not be stressed out. And so 1980, I'm sorry, 1996, I walked away from three lawsuits. I walked away from vetoing the settlement with Lotus. I walked away from the uh, WinFax software that came out of originally the Lampard R&D team as a eugenicist. Um, And I walked, and so there was a possibility of um, being involved in a lawsuit and getting funds back for that. And I walked back away from suing um, uh, the Royal Bank and Coopers and Librand um, Cooper's Library being our bank who called the loan because I'd raised $23 million for ATI Technologies to take over my public company, Landpar, and we would have had 10% of ATI that sold for uh, $6 billion uh, many years ago. Um, and so 
uh, KY Ho friend wanted a public company as a public instrument, and I was going to be a right hand man. And um, the bank called the loan. I'd raised 23 million and a half that I needed uh, for the reverse takeover. I just needed another 2 million, I need 25 total. And people in Vancouver were willing to put in the 2 million, but they needed two weeks of due diligence just because they couldn't just send a check for 2 million. But the bank called the loan. And the law firm, Blake Castles, told me, um, you, you know, we can file a, a, a lawsuit because we're seven years from 1989. It's now 96. Statute of limitation, do you want to file the lawsuit? It'll cost you 3,000 bucks. You can sue them for 70 million. And I declined because I didn't want to be having, I didn't want to spend five years in boxes suing a bank with boxes of thousands of pages of documentation. Right. Fighting a lawsuit. So there were three lawsuits that I walked away from in 90 days, tormented by the size of the potential settlements. Um, I asked one of my mentors, um, Seymour Berger, I asked him, I'm, in, I'm tormented by the decision I made to walk away from three situations all in the last three months. He says, Renee, you chose life as your value system. Then it clicked. Wow. I went back to 1986, my mother saying, pick a value system. 1982, the decision. And, and I, I realized that my value system for all my future decisions going forward was going to be no negative emotions and staying young forever. Mm. And so my value system is always on every decision. What will keep me young forever? What will prevent negative emotions? My decisions become really easy. Because I saved 1996, I saved myself from going through legal hell for five years going forward in three different cases. That would really age me. And I could have lost based on the experience of the lawsuit. It's 50 50 whether you win or lose, depending on what the judge feels about the case. Mm-hmm. And um, so all my value systems changed to what's in formycreasure.com, whereby if you want to stay young forever and you walk away from negative things and you stay away from negative emotions, that became the foundation of all my decisions. So, so. Yeah. Yeah. So for, for context, for people listening the for my treasures, Renee, this is something you wrote for your daughters, right? Where it's a foundation of the main things in, in life to abide by. There are that you abide by most specifically too. Yeah. I was inspired by Rudyard Kipling's If. Rudyard Kipling has a poem. Oh, called, great poem. Yeah. So, so I figured, okay, I can put a few, a few paragraphs together also <laughs> of things I've learned. Yeah. I heard that poem first from Warren Buffett referencing it in a shareholder letter two years ago. That's funny. Uh, I love it. Yeah, so good. But I, I did recognize a similarity there. And I really will say the For My Treasures, um, I'll, I'll show it on the screen and I'll also link it in the description. Everyone should read it because, I mean, it, it's very well written. It's very, like when I read it, I felt a kind of calm in like, uh, uh, it's like a nice silence while I was reading it. And it's just, I could tell you put a lot of thought behind that. It's very true. Uh, and truthful to you, so it's great work. The the um, we talked about the value system, not make decisions, and in that um, there's another paragraph there on rhythm. So the rhythm concept being universal, which I mentioned, applied to visual animation, to sound, music, uh, silence between words, betweenness. So if I say to you, I left my book downstairs. It's not just a statement, it's please go get it. So the rhythm in my in my sentence, the right. silence between the words really tells you meaning and context. Architecture, it's, it's the spaces between the lines. Photography, it's the relationship between the photographer and the subject, the so betweenness of photographer and subject, or between subject and environment. So you're capturing a relationship of some sort in photography. Um, in moods, it's not having been depressed or being um, ecstatic, 
it's a fluctuation of moods, a betweenness of moods that builds your, builds your body. And Elie Wiesel, uh, my favorite author, the, the scribes in concentration camps, how fluctuation of moods help rebuild the body. But besides luck and, and uh, dignity, uh, mood fluctuation physically builds your body. And so if you're feeling depressed, call a friend in another country, another city that you laugh with and just laugh together. The fluctuation mm -hmm. of mood will rebuild your body. And so between this is universal concept. Um, problem solving when your patents look at the items that are interconnecting the betweenness to help find the patent claim. Taken to its ultimate, I realize that life must be the same. It's not about my destiny or your destiny. It's about the betweenness of destinies. So life is a, to me is about the rhythm of destinies. How I say something to one person, they say something to someone else. Yeah. And the relationship between each other impacts each other. And so ha having a negative destiny doesn't necessarily mean that it's bad. Because if it can have good consequences on someone else or other people, a great um, point. then that destiny has been fulfilled as having value. So the founder of Starbucks mentioned in his book, mentioned his book that um, his father had alcoholic problems and had trouble getting out of his lifestyle. And it motivated him to build a company where he could hire thousands of people and help thousands of people. So someone's negative destiny can result in something positive for others. And so I never question destiny. I just have faith that it has a purpose in its relationship to other people's destinies. And so it goes across species. A person that's, that's um, upset about whatever, um, their dog may be kept in a kitchen so it doesn't, won't bite other dogs. If the person's circumstance changes, because of something, the mood changes, the dog will stop biting people and does not be kept in the kitchen. And so we can impact species through the notion of interaction of destinies. <laughs> it's really cool. It doesn't, it doesn't, it's not limited to humans. Yeah, the, the impact, exactly. The impact we have on others, it's, it's something I've been realizing lately too. It's one's words or what they do, their actions, just anything can matter to another person more than one knows. Um, so it's important to know that everything you do matters. But then something I had brought up to you before that I wanted to bring up again now is, is this amazing beauty of life, the way everything was created in that our communication is so vital to everything we do. And like talking about you, where you have a big um, knowledge on information, and media it's like all those things are vital to what we see out in the world design even <laughs> incorporated into that but when it comes to humans talking to each other communication and words is the most critical thing we have here to advance anywhere and to live so i find it amazing that we have that ability but also there's this fascination in miscommunication too and people's own biases uh, misperceiving something that someone else is trying to give off and how that happens countlessly without recognition oftentimes or without not acknowledgement or knowing. Um, it's just incredible. <laughs> we're, we're, so not equipped. Yeah, we're not equipped to, uh, to understand our destiny. We're not equipped to. We're limited by our perceptions as our realities. Mm -hmm. We just don't have the physiological <laughs> ability to, to understand life after life and that's why I just accept it as being the relationship between destinies because we're not equipped to perceive purpose right yeah right well that, that's that's the something I read in for my treasures it's we don't know much about what's to come that's why being stapled into the present is so important um so, yeah, I mean, that's, that's really it, <laughs> you know. Uh, to, your, to your point, uh, when, whenever kids you have, used to ask me what happens after we die, or anybody brings up the topic, I always say, does a, cat, does a caterpillar know it's going to become a beautiful monarch 
butterfly. We're not equipped to, the caterpillar's not equipped to know it's going to become a monarch butterfly. We're not <laughs> equipped to know what's going to happen after we die. Hmm. Yeah. So why why worry? <laughs> we just don't know. Yeah, yeah. It's it's beyond our control. And uh that's where that's where faith comes in, right? That's that's that important yeah. topic. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's a huge topic, faith. Um we touched on something um which I don't want to forget about, which is uh values really as related to entrepreneurship and um creativity and startup failures and success of startups. Mm. Uh, as a investor and as a um, involved person involved in startup companies, um, I've, I've always seen startups fail um, not because of business plans and technology, because of value systems that aren't aligned. So either you have ethics or you don't. And I've seen failures of companies because the partner's values aren't aligned. Whenever you get involved in ego, greed, dishonesty, the startup's bound to fail. And so I've never lost on business plans or technology, I've lost on people. Mm. And when you're creating a startup and you've got partners or you're selecting partners, <clears throat> you better select people with the same value systems, make sure that they're aligned because if they're not, you can have problems. And those are more serious in business plans and technology. Uh, right. Yes, it's nice to have, you know, you want to have the technology that you're investing in. Uh, but but the, the fact is, it's not technology that's going to fail the company when, when value systems aren't the right value systems. Wow, that, that kind of, uh, I've been marinating on this exact topic and the way you just said what you said, kind of had a little explosion in my head here. So a nice little realization. That's, that's very true. It's very, yeah. very much true. And, and I always say I invest in the glimmer of someone's eyes, not in the business plan or technology, because mm. I want to see the passion and, and excitement in the person's vision. Mm. If you want to bring a person's vision to reality and their dream big, you want to bring their dream to reality. Mm. Um, you want someone's going to, want to work around the clock, that's going to wake up excited every day um, and and have a passion about what they, they've chosen. And that goes back to original conversation about a cause. If there's a cause that someone's excited about, about and that they can have impact, the only significant risk is the misalignment of the values of the team. And so you, you, right. got to, you got to make sure that that the negatives aren't there that can cause it to fail and that the positives of the individual are there. Hmm. And then if you have a CEO that can pivot and adapt to changing conditions and that's prepared because of no ego, prepared to listen to advice, um, you have the right kind of person hmm. that can lead the company. Yeah, there, there is a chart I once saw of the ways in which startups fail the laundry list of, of reasons, but uh, the one that always stuck out to me was the CEO's ego. Yeah. And, uh, to avoid that, to have that not be the case is will guarantee success most of the time. Cause you're a lot of the times like you, you as an investor or even people on, on a team in a startup, they're betting on the, the jockey, you know, re leading the horse, right? It's not the horse that, so it's great points. It's hard for one person to do it alone. So if you can have a quality team where everyone has one leg of the table, you got a right. stable table, everyone's got different skill sets, but mutual respect of each other. And, and what happens is sadly, say one person doesn't contribute for three, four months, that doesn't matter. If that person is going to contribute three, four months from now, equivalently. And if a person doesn't work on the weekends, because of their value systems, but somebody else does, doesn't necessarily mean they deserve more shares. As soon as you get greed playing into why am I working more than that person? I did this on the weekend, and I, it's because of me that this happened. That kills that kills companies. So you need mutual respect, common values, no ego, no greed, no dishonesty, 
Um, and and people's contribution will vary at different times in the relationship of the partnership. So, so what if one doesn't contribute as much at a certain point in time as someone else, if you're business partners? Exactly. Now, wise, wise words. <laughs> yeah, I, I hope it resonates with listeners. Take notes. On that topic. <laughs> Go um, ahead. I'm just going to pause and see if there's a topic I missed as a topic. Yeah, go ahead. Um, there, there's something which I think is important in following technology all these years. I grew up with Marshall McLuhan, the medium is a message, understanding media. And so each medium is unique whether it's tweet having its characteristics of X number of characters, whether it's instant messaging, uh, when BlackBerry came out and people could use a keyboard to send messages to each other, you could have a boardroom meeting and in the boardroom meeting you could silently communicate with another board member what your thoughts were <laughs> without voice interfering and everyone hearing it. Hmm. Uh, interactive messaging versus I send a message and the person can read it when they want at their leisure. But uh, interaction when you need social etiquette for quick response. So every medium has its message. The internet, mistakenly, a, few, a couple of people in the industry whose names I won't mention, used to say, the internet is an information highway. No, it's not. I used to say, it's a communications medium mm. between people. It brings people together across common interest groups internationally. It's a, it, information is a subset. It is not the prime value of the internet. Communications is. The power of communications, if you go back to 1996, 97, 97 John McAfee, bless him, um, had a company um, which had a chat called Pow Wow, the most beautiful chat interface. In contract with Discord, that's a disastrous interface. The chat interface, um, the people in chat rooms maybe um, had no money for food, they were on food stamps. And yet they would pay $25 a month to AOL to get the diskette to be able to access the internet because the power of communications, they could meet people that could take them out of poverty. And so, um, the power of, of communications over food boggled my mind in the late 90s. The, the power of communications now that you can see in our society, the metaverse. So it's too easy to fall into the trap of, of incremental improvement or taking what exists and applying it to the word metaverse. You have to ask again, what is the medium creates its uniqueness. And so for me, the potential of the word metaverse is really, again, communications. And if I look at my mother, who's 99, in a wheelchair in a long-term care home, she's restricted by the wheelchair physically. When she, when she dreams, a dream is real. So when she's dozing off, she's having a very real experience. We live in our minds, I say 80% of the time, unless as you alluded to, mindfulness and living in the present, we usually live in our minds. And so our, our dreaming brings a, a reality to us in our dream. She may think of her parents and, and her, my father who died 15, 16 years ago, and she'll wake up from dozing off and she'll say to a PSW or nurse, I just had dinner with my, my parents. Well, they can look at her and say, she must have dementia. How, how crazy can you be? The truth is the dream was real. She, you're, when I dream, I'm free of physical limitations. She's free of her, of her wheelchair when she's dreaming. In bed, she's dreaming. In the wheelchair, she's dreaming. But it's a beautiful, beautiful reality she's experiencing. So for me, the, the metaverse represents the ability to, to dream while awake. 
And so if I can create an environment, we can have environments where people can live in those environments free of the physical or cognitive limitations, free of the wheelchair, interacting, communications again, interacting with other people in those in that metaverse, in those environments, that interaction is as real as, as a dream is when dreaming, but can be real while awake without the limitations, physical and cognitive. Mm. And that means that one could interact with people who are dead. 20 years from now, when we've captured thoughts for, for individuals, and when we get collaboration from people who knew the people, we'll be able to ask, I'll be able to ask Nolan McLaren in a metaverse, which is nothing more than personas interacting, whichever persona I choose based on the environment I'm in, I'll be able to ask, what do you think of that film? And either thoughts that have been captured or people that knew the person can answer live in real time, he would have thought the following on that subject. Mm. I knew him, I think he would have thought the following. His thoughts that were captured, he can answer to the extent that the AI systems mm -hmm. will provide answers to the question. But we can be in an environment where you can communicate with people who are alive in a multitask environment and or people who are no longer alive where we have information about their thinking processes. And so it's yeah. really beyond games, beyond shopping. So if you look at the traditional world, predicting the metaverse, oh, well, it's going to be a great place to shop. Yeah. <laughs> All the big companies are rushing in. I'm going to set up my store in the metaverse and sell more goods. And the gamers, uh, who I love, because I love the creative process, I love gaming, are saying, oh, no, it's going to be a universe of game for gamers. I'm saying it's just like the internet isn't just an information highway, it's a communication medium. The metaverse is going to be a freedom from limitations, physical, cognitive, and it's going to be an environment where you can be many people, depending on what environment you go in. If you go into an environment where you've got billionaires, do you want to show off your board apes, your cat, your cat bot from Kibotica to have prestige? If you're going to an environment that's a business environment, you can't go in with it as a persona of a, of a caricature. You got to go in some form of being professional. People can look in your wallets and see what you've bought. Your personality is exposed by what you've purchased. Mm. That's a whole new environment with new technical tools and a whole new medium of what's possible. Right. Wow. That that was a great explanation and a perspective I haven't gotten from about the metaverse. Um, yeah. And I, based on our conversation, you have an inkling to, I wouldn't say predict, but see what will happen in the current moment and what will come from that technology or, or space. So if I were to you know, bet on someone, I would say, all right, you know, Renee knows what he's talking about. So yeah, communication medium, but no cognitive um, physical boundaries. And no, no physical boundaries. Yeah. Another, in your wheelchair can, can experience physical freedom, just like a dream. Right. When, I dream my, when I dream my mother and my father every week, they're, she's free of her wheelchair and he's alive. And he's talking to me and I'm talking with him. And she's walking around. It's, it's, it's a dream space. Well, we, can, wow. we can create those spaces while we're awake. Mm. We don't have to dream to be free and communicate. Right, right. That's amazing. It's, uh, it's totally exciting. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I know you, you're, you're in a couple, you're in Reddit, you're in spaces where people are in the next um, innovations of NFTs and metaverse. So, I'm sure you have a lot to say on that topic uh, and you're around a lot of people who know a lot of what they're doing. So yeah, you got to surround yourself with those so you can learn more mm. about it. Oh yeah. On, on surround yourself. Um, you're the average. I've once heard, which I love, you're the average of the five people you spend the most time with. So you might as well pick them wisely and spend time with outstanding people or that you care about a lot to mm. make use of the, you know, the average you, you're going to become. You don't want to be with bad people, dishonest people, ego, greed, negative, because that's going to impact your 
be average. If you, if you spend an hour with someone that's lousy as a person, you're decreasing your average. <laughs> you don't want to go on one hour. <laughs> Simple math. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Let alone full time or five, you know, for working with people, spending hours with them if, if they're not the quality that you want to become yourself. Yeah. And, and the one thing, you know, the person we spend the most time with is ourselves. So I love the statue, wow. the sculpture you have. I would love for you to show that. Wow. 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 <laughs> You know, that, that speaks to um, what my mother said. So there's a statue by Pasquale from the 19th century. Wow. All, all my life for 40 years, looking at my gra grandparents, I thought, gee, it's two people fighting. <laughs> and someone made the observation, hey, it looks like the same, same body. I thought, wow, if I'm an artist, I'm going to depict a person's internal struggle. Because right. people's internal struggles are harder than struggles with the outside world. So a person's struggle with within, with themselves, is the most powerful struggle that takes place in life. And so, and so, so the concept of internal struggles, um, when I do handwriting analysis, I came up with a super simple way of, of um, analyzing handwriting. I look for the fighting within a person. And so if I see the heights of the letters fighting, that's intellectual side. If I see connected and not connected letters, that's impulsive if it's not connected and if spontaneous and spontaneous. If it's if all letters are tightly joined in, a, in words and sentences, it's logical consequential thinking. Uh, the lower half of the letters like G's and Y's are the sensuality. The top half of the letters are intellectual. If there's fighting that they're not consistent, so the letter, the height of the letters are uneven, they're not consistently the same height. The lower letter, half of the letters aren't consistent. They, some are longer and others not. The slants for the right to the future, left to the past. If there's a fighting between the, the slants of the letters, um, the person's fighting with the past and the future, or they're fighting intellectually. If someone's impulsive and they have high letters, but they're, the letters are fighting, the, the, the letters are trying to be joined, but they're not, the person's fighting being intellectual and impulsive because they won't have their feet on the ground. So they're worried that they'll lose control to the intellectual and impulsiveness. Mm. And so that's the concept is accurate 100% of the time when you see conflicts or lack of conflict. If there's lack of conflict in, this, in a concept of handwriting 101, it means that they're comfortable in that part of it. If there's fighting, they're uncomfortable. And so the, 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 that's 100% accurate based wow. on since he, you know, 30 years of whenever I look at handwriting and I go straight to the core of the person and I say, you're fighting the following within yourself. And they're in shock that I go to the core of who they are, what they're fighting. 90% of the time, the following is also true. That the reason they're fighting within themselves is that they're fighting not wanting to have the same destiny as one of their two parents. And so I found it universal that a struggle within yourself is not wanting the same destiny as one of your parents. So if you recognize the same chemistry, you suddenly start worrying that your chemistry is going to lead you to the same destiny as that one parent. The person always had their heads in the clouds. The person was a aggressive person, yet I have the same chemistry. The person bullied their spouse. I'm scared I'm going to be the same because I have the same chemistry. And it turns out chemistry, that d destiny is not transmitted through DNA. And so you don't have to worry about having the same destiny as that parent that you're scared that you have the same chemistry as that parent. Exactly. It's not transmitted. You're free. And so by a certain point in time, you, there's a fire that burns in you, which will protect you. And as soon as you see a red flag, you say, my gosh, I'm in that situation. Um, I have to control my chemistry because I don't want the same destiny. But you don't have to live all the time with that internal struggle because it prevents you from going forward in the future. So internal fighting prevents you from going forward. And to eliminate the fighting, you have to realize 
you don't have to have the same destiny as that parent. Mm. The reason it's only 90% is the person may be adopted. They may have been brought up by an uncle or an aunt. And so the concept of a parent, um, it may not have been a parent that brought them up. That's why it's only 90% accurate, 95% accurate. Mm. Um, so the combination of what is fighting within a person and the fact that they, if there is fighting, there's a high likelihood is that the person is being held back by fear of having the same destiny as a parent whose chemistry they have the same chemistry with, but they don't want to have the same destiny. And if by chance you're impulsive and, and, and creative and spontaneous, but you also have the ability to be logical, A follows B follows C, consequential, if you have both in you, all you have to do is not fight it, but simply use it and manage it. So when you're in a, in a meeting, when you're brainstorming, let the impulsive, spontaneous, creative side flourish. If you're in a meeting where they've already decided on the financial projections and presenting the results of it, the last thing they want is someone to say, well, what if right. this, what if that? Well, where were you when we were discussing it? Right. You know, keep your mouth shut. We've already made the decision. <laughs> We've got a plan in place. You know, be logical, sequential, consequential. Manage your chemistry for the situation that you're in to mm -hmm. maximize its effectiveness. That's, yeah, another perspective I never heard of. I never thought that looking at someone's handwriting, just a sentence can point exactly to where their internal <laughs> state's at. It's rather interesting, but... Um, it takes me wow. five minutes of looking at a few sentences of someone. I, you know, I, I, I recently got an email with two pages of a person's handwriting. I used to do this as a hobby from the 80s. Uh, and I said to them, exactly what I said to them, you've got both skills inside of you. You can be either intuitive, spontaneous, creative, or you can be logical, consequential. And obviously you're fighting the impulsive, spontaneous one because it's not uniform, consistent. That's because one of your two parents was creative and had a negative destiny because of it. And it turned out that I think the mother was was always bullying the father and, and you don't want to be you don't want to have a chemistry that makes you stepped on by another person, but it's your chemistry. So mm -hmm. you don't want the chemistry of the negative person, parent, because you don't believe in it. So you're torn within yourself as to who do I want to be like when I see I have a certain chemistry. And um, at, at distributor meetings in the 80s, I used to go to an international trade show, and I'm sitting there, and I've got two people at a table. I say, can I see your handwriting? So I see both handwriting and I say to one person, that person over there has the following characteristics, which you are against and triggers a certain response. So you're never going to give them a chance to say what they're going to say because it brings up all this negative response. So you'll never give them a chance to express themselves. That person looks at me and says, yeah, she does that to me all the time. <laughs> she always interrupts me and doesn't let me say what I want. And I'm saying that's because she's prejudging you. Her chemistry mm. is right away responding. Because, it, because of the conflict she has within herself about that particular chemistry. Wow. So, so that's <laughs> another example of how we expose you know, perceptions, reality, and right. we, communication is everything. Yes, yes, it is. It is. Yeah, all, all wonderful points. And uh, I know we've covered a lot during our conversation, but if there's any, if there's anything you would like to end off with or bring up that hasn't been mentioned, uh, you can go yeah. ahead. I was just emphasizing how significant and important our being different is yeah. to the creative process, to innovation, entrepreneurship, um, and how we just have to embrace being different. That's the most important thing to me. Absolutely. Um, yeah yeah that's that's it that's it we're all extremely similar but uh very unique and different and uh leaning into the latter for sure so there's there's gems here and i appreciate all that was talked about and uh for Me you too. taking the time to talk about it all it's really worthwhile information all stuff you've learned throughout your life that you've given to everyone listening now so appreciate it likewise awesome thank you anthony Thank you, Renee. Bye.